Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to this gathering in Window Christian Church. Really glad to see you here this morning. Welcome you out on Zoom and on Facebook Live, and those of you who will be watching it later. I hope that everyone will prepare their hearts, have something that can be your bread and your cup, and we will come together in Christ around the table a little bit later. We welcome you in the love of Christ. I don't care how bad a week you had, right now, God loves you. I don't care how good a week you had, you didn't cause the goodness. It was God that did it. So let's all gather grateful for the goodness that's in our lives and grateful for the grace for all that's not so good in our lives. And we're really glad to be here. Let's share our welcome this morning. Welcome, all who were here, welcome. Welcome, my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment, welcome. Welcome, spirit of the risen Christ among us, welcome. Together, we willingly enter communion one with another, welcome. Sing, come and fill our hearts. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Hallelujah. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Hallelujah. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O oh Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glad that you're here today, and I pray that this is a day where our hearts can be filled. Christ's love and goodness. Let's share our call to worship. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all his mighty Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has called his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious. He provides food for those who fear him. Let's sing our hymn of praise. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Jesus shall reign where sun does in excessive journeys run his love shall spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more <clears throat> to Christ shall in this prayer be made endless praises crown his head his name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice people and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweet Voices shall proclaim <clears throat> on his name. Blessings abound where he reigns. All prisoners leap to lose their chains. The weary find eternal. 
saints belong. Angels descend with songs again. And earth repeats. Yeah, Lord in prayer. As we sang, people and realms of every tongue. Well, on your love, my sweetest song. We can take time now to sing your praises. The sweetest ways that we can give you praise is by seeking you, allowing your grace and love to enter into our lives and do the work that you desire to do there, and then being willing to cooperate with your spirit and go out and tell people and show people the reality that you love us all that you have in your son, Jesus Christ, announced to everyone a welcome, an invitation to sit at the table, to be embraced by your arms, to be taken into a fellowship that not only knows your love, but makes your love known. We offer you praise in the midst of over 13,000 different people groups around the world in all those places and languages and cultures. We want to be among those who say yes to Jesus as Lord and yes to the entrance of your spirit into our lives and yes to a willingness of your spirit to flow through us into the world that needs you so much. So accept the praise of our lips, the very reality of our hearts, and help us to be a people that become the fulfillment of the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Yeah, maybe seated. Allie, you all willing to come down? Mom. You bring a friend with you today? What's her name? Hi, Cameron. You're all right, Cameron. I'm a nice person. I have a mask on, but I'm really nice. <laughs> I want to talk today about promises we make and promises we keep. When you show up at school, your teacher wants you to promise. What do you think she want, he or she would want you to promise when you show up at school? Tell me some things that your teacher wants you to promise to do at school. Yeah, good. What's that promise? Remember anything on it? Practice safety. Responsible at all times. Use intelligent choices. <laughs> this is a high standard, you said. Demonstrate self-control. Earn and give respect. To the teacher, staff, and peers. Oh, that's a, that was a good job. That was excellent. And when I was a Cub Scout, I promised to do my best, do my duty to God and my country, to be square and to obey the law of the pack. And yes, I thought back, what does square mean? Uh, but anyway, and when we come into church, we promise to follow Jesus and we promise to love one another. And I just want you to know the world is better when we make really good promises and then we keep them. Like your school's going to run a lot better and you're going to have a lot better experience if everybody keeps those promises. 
And our church becomes what our church is intended to be if we keep the promises of following Jesus as Lord and loving one another. <sighs> In 1978, I promised to love Miss Tammy for the rest of my life. So far, I've been doing it. And I promise to love you guys. As long as we're together as a church, I'm going to love you guys, and we're going to do this together. Let's pray. God, thank you for the promises that are good ones. Thank you for those good promises that help us know how to live better, how to follow you, how to be the people that you want us to be. Thank you for Allie and Cameron. Thank you that they're learning about those good promises, too. And I pray that you would help them and help all of us to make the promise to follow you and love one another and to keep those promises. Amen. Thank y'all very much. <clears throat> I think they're teachers to be proud, wouldn't you? They did a great job. We're now coming to look at our, our prayer list and, um, uh, one thing I know, uh, Ron Pratt went into rehab this past week. I swapped. Ron Pratt went into rehab this week, and then we, um, I haven't heard an update in the last couple of days. We're hoping that he continues to get better. Um, I've been trying to get to see Bill Parrish, and um, I was going to go one day this week, and I, I, something came up in my work, and I couldn't go. But then Trisha told me that it was a, he was having a really rough day. So be praying for Bill. Wanting him to have a good enough day to have some visits. I'd like to be one of them, but um, be praying for Mr. Bill. Um, Colton Hines, who's in the, uh, the, the Goal Campbell crowd, um, is a disabled young man, and he was facing and fighting COVID, and he came home this weekend. This nice. Anybody else have any updates or additions to the prayer list? Let's have a minute or so of silent prayer, and then I'll voice a prayer for us. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, our hearts are drawn to people that we know. People come to mind. Some of them are struggling. Some of them are going through some joyous times. I saw you in a rededication and a recommitment service of a couple that had been married for 43 years. I've seen you go through grief with folks. We've been to a wedding recently. I also know people that are struggling with physical ailments, with hardships of emotion. People trying to recover from some bad choices they've made in their lives. There are people in our world who are looking for the basic needs to be met and are finding the places empty. There are people who are struggling deeply in silence and in isolation. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would work in ways that we can't see in the depths of souls where you can, only you can reach that you would work through us to give words of encouragement, to serve in the ways that we live our lives, and to give our resources to support the work of those who are on the front lines in so many places, in so many ways. We need you now. We need you every day. But in this moment, as we think of those who are struggling, and as we give you our own struggles and confess our sins, Pray that we would just know your grace, the fullness of your spirit, and have the ability to trust ourselves and all of these that we love to you. In the name of Christ, amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen. As we gather now at the table,
We have bread and we have the cup. That is a reminder that we have Jesus Christ, the one who will in these moments and in every moment, if we pause and recognize it, love us and be with us and call us to be together. We are a fellowship, a covenant of people that have decided to be together in Christ and to follow Christ together. We are living in loving partnership. Let's sing the hymn of communion, 497. In loving partnership we come, seeking, O oh God, your will to do. Our prayers and actions now we see, we freely offer them to you. We are the by grace each other's need. We dare to risk the sacrifice with truthful word and faithful deed. Loving community we see your hope and strength Virginia Moore will lead us in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts, Lord. Help us to come in humility, without pride, without any bitterness, or any God, acknowledging that you are the bread of life, God. We are here because of your great love. Help us never to forget what you did for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. He was betrayed, Jesus broke bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Thank you. Our elder Ben Lambeth will lead us in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for this great privilege for dining with you, Lord, and the Son especially, Lord, for someone like myself, a sinner like me. We thank you for everyone but throughout the whole world with your gift of grace prayer and control. Pray in the precious holy name of Jesus, the Son, our Savior. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and said, this is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Thank you. Our Amen. In an expression of the reality that we have given our very selves, our souls, our entire lives, and all of our resources to the Lord, we dedicate a portion of what we have to support this church and the work of Christ around the world. And we say thank you to the Lord and God that gives us all. And thank you to the faithful ones among us.
to one another as we support our church and, his, and God's work around the world. To God's glory. Amen. Let's sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And now Gull is going to share a scripture with us. Good morning. This morning's scripture comes from Acts 15, verses 1 through 12, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this, this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. The new, this news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart and showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders of God that had done, um, was done among the Gentiles through them. Thank you, Gay. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you can imagine the scene, but that was a tense moment. I don't know if you caught it, but here's some people saying to someone else, um, you say you know Jesus Christ and you've had this spiritual experience and you're proving by your life that things are changing from the moment you say you follow Jesus Christ. But we just want you to know you're not saved yet until you do what we think you have to to do to get saved would anybody be a little myth that somebody came up to you with it and then at first i would go i might think i would go well tell me about that because i want to make sure i'm saved but i wouldn't be sitting there thinking i didn't have the experience that god wasn't in my life because i would have lived it and there they were having this big question come to them but like I said last week, when we were talking about the centrality of communion and that we have no creed but Christ as the disciples of Christ, you really want to order. What do you do? What day do you worship? What seasonal festivals do you keep? 
how do you teach your children and what do you teach them about God and how to have faith and how to love and live in the world? Well, it's important stuff. And so the, the intensity of the moment that Gaynell just read about, the, the conflict, they had a lot of conflict. It was a long, hard discussion. It happened in a few verses, but I don't think it happened in a few minutes. I think there was a long, intense discussion because what was at stake was huge. And what we meet to talk about this morning and debate in our own minds and gather around together is how will we know when we are in right relationship to God and how to move forward and live in harmony with what God wants? I really don't think there's a bigger, more important question, right? And some of us live our lives, and at least for me, some mornings by, the, by noon, I haven't thought much about that. I thought about what I was eating and what was on the news or a thousand other things. And then I get to lunch and I start to say my little prayer that I was taught to pray a long time ago with my meal. And I think, oh, oh, God, I, I need to include some God in this. I want you to know why we love being Christian. One reason is we're a covenant people of love. We are a covenant people of love. The word covenant is important. There are covenants in scripture. And I just want to tell you, God makes commitments of how God will relate to us, and God keeps his side of all those commitments. We make covenants back to God, and there are versions of covenants through the scriptures. I won't take time to unpack them, and you're welcome, because the sermon would be really long. But what it amounts to is there are these obligatory covenants. I will do this, and I will do that, obligatory covenants, and there are promissory covenants. I promise, and it moves forward. And you're going to keep the promise, even though it, it unfolds. It's not precise. Yes, I'll be married to you till I die. And then you find out that that person is a little different than you thought when you got married. And that person has the right to develop as a person and change all along. And you're supposed to support it. That's the way it works in marriage and in friendships and in every place, including workplaces. We make these covenants, how I intend to relate. And we are people who have intended to relate as a group of people who love each other. That's the short version of the sermon. Now the longer version. Back when this new community was forming that was read about by Gaynell in Acts chapter 15, there was a big shift going. Follow Moses in the law and all of these, remember, 10 commandments. Then in the Deuteronomical and Levitical law, there's a total of, y'all remember this number yet, 613 positive commands and negative prohibitions. And then they were making comments and rabbis were doing what preachers do. They were talking about what that actually means, those 613. And they had come to all kinds of agreements and disagreements about how to do that. And now somebody comes along and says, you know that 613 and all that commentary? The Holy Spirit comes directly to people, and you don't have to go through all of that. Somebody stands up and says, no way. If you're going to be one of us, you've got to be like us. And let me tell you, like us is 10 plus 613 plus all the commentary. That's what it means to be like us and one of us. And if you don't do it, you don't get it. Well, when the Christian church disciples of Christ were born, there had been a big shift. The Protestant churches had broken from the rule of the Pope. The Holy Roman Empire was dissolved, and now you had, a, you had the Roman Catholic Church, but the Pope was still in charge, and Martin Luther is among those who started it. It was happening in other places too, but he gets most of the credit for breaking away and saying, now we don't have to go through the Pope and the councils and all the creeds and everything. Now we can go directly to God by faith in Jesus Christ. And the people said, amen, that's right, exactly right. We didn't have to go through no Pope. So then you have to say, well, then what do you have to do? I just want you to know that between then and now, I, I don't know if you've thought about it or noticed, but there are 34,000 different denominations that are fighting over what you do and how you do it and what you believe and what you have to believe and what you could believe. 34,000. And the whole world that's not in that 34,000 churches is looking on and saying, well, if y'all can't agree to get along and love each other, Maybe this thing isn't really working. It is just a power system. And you just have your own little local popes who declare what you have to do and believe. 
huh. well, I just want you to know, I've been in conversations where that's precisely what I was accused of being part of. You just decide what you're going to believe, and you're your own local pope. Everybody in your church either believes that, or they, they, they leave, or they agree. Really? Well, our denomination, our fellowship, and we really don't like carrying the, the moniker, moniker of a denomination. We like being a covenant fellowship. Because what we decided was that there were a few things that make us who we are, and we want to answer the question, who can be a disciple of Christ? We want to answer the question, how do you know you're a disciple of Christ? We want to answer the question, what guides our life, our lives as disciples of Christ? Legitimate. I think we need to know the answer to that. Well, I just think we're better off if we know how to follow Christ. I actually think Jesus Christ offers us a way that works. And I would put the definite article before that, offers us the way, the truth, the life that works. So here's some things to think about that are part of our tradition. One is authentic spirituality. Authentic spirituality. You know we can put on airs that look spiritual, don't you? You can walk into a room and say the right words, and everybody, whoo, that person knows Authentic spirituality is a different bird altogether. Authentic spirituality isn't done in performance to people, but is done in relationship to God. It isn't done for money or recognition. It is done to become an expression of, an example of, a manifestation of, an incarnation of Jesus, God's will in the world. You see, what we're saying is that we don't need any authority other than our living God, our living Lord, our spirit of Christ in us to tell us who we are, our identity. Who are you? You think your mom and daddy told you? You think your name carries your identity? That's how people distinguish you from others, but your identity is in Christ. Don't take any compromise verse. Learn all of the true things that you were taught as a, as a child and as an adult about who you are, yes, learn all the good things, but, but sort them out. The ones that are in harmony with God, keep. And the ones people tell you you are that aren't in harmony with God, just, no, nah, I'm not wearing that one. I'm not going to keep it. How about your value? Who decides you're valuable? Who decides you're worth loving? Who decides you're worth loving when you do your worst? Authentic spirituality says, no, I don't go around waiting on the approval of men and women. I don't go around needing people to tell me I'm worth something because God has announced in the cross of Christ and the resurrection, God has announced in the very fabric of creation that God has chosen for me, George, to exist, you to exist. Your value has been established by the fact that you exist and that the spirit of God dwells within you. You are valuable, beautiful, awesome. And even if your awesomeness gets on some people's nerves, it's still true. And no, you don't have to ask anybody about your significance. Do you think you ought to do something really important? Do you think you ought to be on the, on the map, be, get lots of likes and shares? Well, I just want you to know what we say is that in authentic spirituality, in our dynamic relationship with Christ, my significance is directly related to how much I live in harmony with my part of what God wants done in the world. And when I do that, if people don't notice, it'll be all right. We don't need a priest telling us our identity, value, and significance. We don't even need a preacher telling us our identity, value, and significance. And we certainly don't need some creed to be written by some group of people and come tell us who we are. Now, the good news is there are some priests and preachers and statements that have been written that are helpful. But they're not true, and we don't agree with them because of who wrote them. But the truth came, contained within the words and actions and life of a priest, a preacher, a creed, or another Christian brother or sister. We have a relationship with Christ, and we have the responsibility in authentic spirituality to believe together. Remember the Greek word that's translated believe means to be actively committed to something. It doesn't mean to think something's true. To believe something isn't to say, I think it's right. I think it's accurate. Authentic spirituality to believe together. Remember, the Greek word that's translated believe means to be actively committed to something. It doesn't mean to think something's true. To believe something isn't to say, I think it's right. I think it's accurate. 
That's what Thanks, I said. Well, I need to believe together. What happened? There we go. Oh, I see. It was the Facebook Live coming later. Okay. That's it. It goes a little later on Facebook. That's what it is. So we are to believe together. Believe means to be actively committed to something. When do you believe something? When you're actually doing it. You can wear the jersey and sit in the stands. That's what I'm saying. You're on the team till you're on the field, till you're on the pitch, till you're on the court, till you're there in the midst of the loving fellowship and doing what your faith bids you to do. So we're in the Commission on Theology from the, our denomination. He says that we need a common understanding of this authority or we'll be controlled by biblicism, self-seeking individuals, or self-serving institutions. I just want you to know, our whole heritage would say that's exactly right. We're not doing biblicism where you separate fellowship because you interpret what verse differently than someone else. We're not doing that. And we're not going to get some high mighty preacher or some high mighty individual who says they know the truth and divides the church or the body of Christ again. And we're not going to have some institution that just demands that you flow and give money and just do what they tell you. Aren't you glad you're part of that? I'm just like, you, you bet. That's exactly what I think. But then you're left with, are you really believing together? It's not just sit and believe and know you're secure and do nothing different. In fact, if you go back to the restoration movement that we were part of, that let's get back to the church before it was contaminated by the Roman Empire and all of that. There were three things we demanded in our tradition. One is a genuine conversion experience. The second is to share communion regularly, to be with the bread and the cup. And the third is to be non credal In other words, you don't come with a finished statement and tell us we have to believe. Um, this past week, uh, Rob, our, uh, our musician, uh, sent me a, a link. I'm not going to read the whole article that was worth reading, but it was an article written by an atheist who was reflecting on his observations of the church, and it included him talking about the Jesus he came to understand. So I'd like to read you the, what this person, he, he's, he's having a conflict between what he sees in the church and what he understands Jesus to be. And this is an atheist describing Jesus. I like and respect this Jesus. He was a rebel. He was, he was an anti-authoritarian. I just want to go check. He dedicated his life to helping the poor, the sick, the indigent, and the people who were discarded and rejected by society. Yep. He hung out with sex workers and lepers and gave comfort to the sick, the suffering, and he loudly and relentlessly called out the hypocrisy of his religion and its leaders. Only got that right, too. As I understand it, he was like, and this is a, his quote, Jesus speaking, hey, you're a sinner. That's a bummer. Let me help you be a better person. No. I don't expect anything from you for that. I just want to be as loving as I can be to you. And he concludes with his own words, he was a really cool guy. You know what I think? I think he just doesn't want to be institutionalized and authoritarian taken over. I think that's what he's saying. I don't think he's atheist i think he understands jesus and longs for that and it's evidence that the spirit is drawing him into the truth about jesus because all these people who say they believe in god and they're not atheists but theists and they believe in god and all these people who say jesus is son of god they don't do what he observed jesus doing we need authentic spirituality right number two the second thing about us as a covenant people of love is that we practice unity and mutual support in that covenant of Christ's love. <clears throat> you may not be surprised, or you may be. There's an epidemic going on. It's not the one that gets all the press right now. There's an epidemic of loneliness happening in our world. Two out of five people, that's 40%, of the people in America say that their social connections are meaningless. Doesn't mean they're not on social media. Doesn't mean they don't Zoom and have P 
people to talk to once in a while. But 40% of people say it's meaningless, and 20%, half of that number, say they feel totally isolated. You want to know when the church will be bringing people in and keeping them and growing? It'll be when people find the solution to their epidemic of isolation inside of a fellowship that loves them purely and completely and ready to do what it takes to get through life together. The early church had to. You see, if you were Christian then, you could get all your property taken away and you'd only have each other. If you were Christian then, you might get dragged down and, and put... They put tar on you and oil on you and light you up and make you a street light. So there weren't a lot of people who weren't really committed inside the church. They had an authentic spirituality and they were committed to one another. People have a deep hunger for love, for mutual support, for people who love and help one another. Help one another live through life and all of its difficulties. Help us grow into the people that we can be and help us flourish. Man. There's a Greek word, koinonia, that's translated fellowship, and you can't reduce it to hanging out and eating dinner. But it will include some meals, and I'm grateful for that. Some of y'all have some of the greatest hits of those experiences with me. It will include meals. In fact, in the early church, it included meals every time they met because it included people who hadn't eaten since the last time the church got together. Our early leaders had this statement that guided them. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love. Go through it. In essentials, unity. Meet with communion, the bread and the cup, no creed but Christ. We are in Christ. In that essential, unity. In non-essentials, all of your opinions and maybe even firmly held beliefs about how it ought to be and what everybody ought to do. And you can tell them all your ought to's and point all your fingers. And no one's telling you not to have beliefs. But our leaders would say, don't let that divide the body of Christ. And don't think you have all the answers and someone else doesn't see them. And in everything, love. Together in Christ loving and all of the diversity of how we think and believe about Christ. We love. And in this book, the Shaping Our Future Together in Christ group that's going to uh, keep leading us towards that process of looking into the future as a church, we've, we read this book that's called Disciples, Who We Are and What Holds Us Together. And we're looking at getting a copy of this book for every household because what we experienced was every one of us, and I had taken the graduate course on history of disciples of Christ, learned something uh, reading this book, and it's fairly easy easy readable stuff. And you know what? You don't even have to agree with everything in this book because in this book, it'll say you don't have to agree with everything. But what this book will say is that we are a covenant people in Christ. We are one with everyone who meets and, and defines their life in Jesus Christ. I'm really glad. And in this book, it says we are a movement of wholeness in a fragmented world. We are a movement of wholeness in a fragmented world. I promise if that becomes truer and truer of us, we will have more and more of us. Because the people caught in that epidemic of loneliness, you could say 40% of the people you see every day are looking for that. If they could find it in a genuine expression where they could gather inside of that kind of love. And the third thing, is that we are baptized into a fellowship of, and I just picked two words, I mean three words, that point the direction that we are to be living when we come out of the waters of baptism. Discovery, growth, and transformation. In fact, when the reflections are done about baptism and church membership, and they, we create statements that, that come out of our leadership in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, here's some things they say about what the baptized people are supposed to be doing. That would be us. One is we're to ensure the community's identity as a people of the gospel. Keep ensuring that who we are is that we are in Christ. We're part of the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's do that. 
The second one is that we enable the body, that is the people, us, the people of God, the church, the congregation, to engage faithfully and cooperatively in mission. One of the things that the group that's shaping our future together in Christ is going to help us do is find the missions that we have, the things we want to keep doing and the new things we might want to do because Christ has given us to do it. We want to find that. And that is what we help each other find. And that is what we help each other do. be on mission together. And the third is to provide guidance for members as they struggle to enact the gospel in their daily lives. Yeah, I say yeah. I say yes. I affirm it. I believe it. I'm actively committed to that being who we are as a church. So it's discovery. In the passage that Gay Nell read, some people were discovering that the Gentiles were in without the law. Oh, that's a discovery now. I sure didn't see that coming. God letting everybody in? Holy cow. We're losing control of everything. And it might be God gaining control of everything. And that's losing control of our control. Hmm. It's also growth. Are y'all still growing up? I loved Allie's statements about the pledge at the school. Mutual respect and all of that, that's just, that's really great. What, when we come here, do we learn? Once in a while, somebody say, hey, I learned something today when you were talking. I'm like, that's good. But it's okay, because I think what we need to do is to hear things over and over and over again. The same things over and over again, so we do it more and more in our lives. We're growing together, and we're being transformed. Growing up and being transformed. It needs to be true the people who knew you 20 years ago can see in your face, in your eyes, in your life, some of what they knew and some of what only Christ could do with the person they knew. They see you and they see some things in you that only Christ could do with the person they knew. I've met several people in my church I was at for 20 years who were coming out of prison. They were coming out of prison for various and sundry reasons, and they would sit down with me and would talk about how their lives had been and how their lives were going. They would be in the midst of trying to get people to trust them again. They would be in the midst of trying to have some stable income. They would be in the midst of rebuilding relationships that had been devastated by what put them in prison and all the other things that were around it. And I had the privilege of watching many of those people over the course of two or three or 15 and now 20, 30 years, get to be people that just didn't look a bit like that person that got out of prison. Except you can look there and that's the same tooth missing. Hmm. You know, or you still got that little quirk you do when you laugh. I recognize the laugh and that's the same tooth. Well, you're not the same person. I had one guy talk to me recently, and he said it was 23 anniversary, 23 anniversary of my sobriety. Door I just wanted to call and say hi. Thank you for being in my life. And I was like, yeah, that's good. He said, and just like you said, I'm easier to love now than I used to be. Easier to love. So, yep, yeah, that's what happens. And, you're, and he's doing more loving. He's started several recovery meetings and sponsors people now. So if you put preachers and churches together, and if churches do their job and preachers do their job, and it produces a group of people that came up out of, their, out of the waters of baptism, and they continue to discover more and more of what God's up to and doing in the world, they, they grow up in Christ, just mature and become solid, and they're transformed into these, into these new people. Those of us that are working on this future vision and and going to help everybody participate in it. We sent out a survey by email. We're going to keep sending it out. And one of the questions is, what do you like? What's, what, what's important to you? What do you value in, in the life of Wendell Christian Church? Another one is, what do you hope for Wendell Christian Church? And another is, what are the challenges that we face as a church? And I really would like you guys, all of you, to really give some thoughtful prayer to that. Because what we'd like to do is ask God to help us preserve everything that's good 
not compromise the hopes of who we can be and face off with the Holy Spirit and conquer all of the challenges that keep us from being everything God wants us to be. Okay, that's work. That's why we're not going to hurry it. We're going to take our time. What I'd like to do now is read the preamble to the document that describes the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. And I'd like you to just listen to it and notice what it affirms. And you might notice in the midst of it what it doesn't say. But notice what it affirms. And I would like to say a big amen to what I'm just about to read. Here it is. Listen to it. As members of the Christian church, we confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and proclaim him Lord and Savior of the world. Amen? In Christ's name and by his grace, we accept our mission of witness and service to all people. Amen? We rejoice in God, maker of heaven and earth, and in God's covenant of love, which binds us to God and to one another. Okay, amen. Through baptism into Christ, we enter into newness of life and are made one with the whole people of God. Amen. In the communion of the Holy Spirit, we are joined together in discipleship and in obedience to Christ. Amen. At the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. We just did. Within the universal church, we receive the gift of ministry and the light of Scripture. In the bonds of Christian faith, we yield ourselves to God that we may serve the one whose kingdom has no end. Blessing, glory, and honor be to God forever. Amen. I say yeah. I hope that you'll take that survey and prayerfully consider it because we are a covenant people of love. And the covenant is held together, made with and held together by our commitment to Christ and to one another. And what we need more than anything is to be in that covenant of love together, to believe together with authentic faith. Hmm. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you are right here with us right now. I thank you that in the midst of the world, there is this place we can come, this group of people we can gather with, and we're all trying to figure out how to love one another better. And I'm glad that you figured it out long ago in eternity past, and that you're still working today and will be working in eternity future, because you know how to love us. You have been loving us in every day of our lives. You have come in Jesus Christ. You have shown your love, demonstrated your grace. And so now fill us with your Holy Spirit. May this be a day in which we not only re-experience your love and grace and an authentic spirituality, a living relationship with you, but a day in which you help us to grow up and to learn and to be transformed and to raise up out of the waters of baptism and become a witness to the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, to the world that needs Christ so much. Help us to break into the lives of people who suffer in that epidemic of loneliness. And help us to help them hear about your love and our love and invite them to be with us in this covenant fellowship of love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing our hymn of commitment. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Let's stand and sing.
there's any commitment that you've made this day, or maybe the Holy Spirit surprises you sometime during the week, please share that commitment with someone that you know who would care and support your relationship with Christ. It's always an opportunity for you to reach out to, to me or to one of our elders and let us encourage you in that very commitment. We pray that we would continue to make fresh commitments to Christ. If you would put one hand on your heart, be reminded that Christ does dwell within you. Christ's covenant is true, and he is keeping the covenant as he dwells within you and calls you to faithfulness. Now go and tell the good news. Tell people in the loneliness of their lives that Christ is with them and you are there too. Go and be the feet and the breath, the hands and the voice of Christ. Amen. Live in charity and set that love. Live in charity. God will dwell with you. Live in charity and set that love. Live in charity. Is there any announcements that we need to make to say Virginia? Bible study time is switching from 9.30 to 10.30 this week. All right, that's great. Now, we'll still be having our devotion at 7.30, like you join worship or on Facebook Live at 7.30 in the morning on Wednesday. Um, we finished the study of prayer, Finding the Hearts for Home. We still have copies of that book. And I would just tell you, it's one of the books that helped my prayer life the most, the most book I've read. So I hope that you'll take time to read that book if you haven't already. And it was a joy to be part of that fellowship uh, each Wednesday uh, going through that study. Be praying for our group that's meeting together that will help us shape our future together in Christ. We're having our next meeting on Wednesday evening, so if you think about it during Wednesday evening, pray for us, and we'll begin to move forward in uh, all of those activities. Um, anything else we need to know this morning? Amen. Love you guys. Have a great week. Wednesday evening. Pray.